Thanks for tuning in to the IGM podcast. We're so glad you've decided to explore God's word with us. We look forward to connecting with you in email at info at or online at our website, www.integritygm.com. We hope this podcast encourages you to grow in the knowledge of God through his word. Be blessed. Blessings to everyone today in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, in the name of Jesus, the Christ. Today, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 2. I have Alan and Laura with me in the studio, and we just finished chapter 1. And in chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, is dealing with how mankind walked away from God and the corporate responsibility for their sin. And we see how this was from the very beginning. And I believe it's a description of mankind from the very beginning, how they walked away and how God released them and gave them over to their own wrong desires. And we see the chaos and the sin that saturated society and how mankind walked away from God. When we flow into chapter 2, but what about the Jewish people? The Jewish people, when I say the Jewish people, I'm going all the way back to Abraham, the Hebrew people who became the Israelites, the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel, who were handed the law, the law of Moses. We look at the Abrahamic covenant and how the people of faith were given the law of Moses at Sinai. Then later on, because of their sin and the sin of Solomon, God split the nation into two nations, the northern kingdom, Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah. Judah had two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And later on, historically, they became known as the Jews. Even though at this time there was still tribal identity, especially with the Benjamites, the Hebrew people were known as Jews. So chapter 2 is centering in on the Jewish people, and they are different. They have a covenant relationship with God that goes all the way back to Abraham, back to Isaac, back to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. The whole history of the people of faith and the law that was given to them and the prophets and the promise of the coming of the Messiah. And we look at the Jewish people and they say, we are not like everyone else. We're circumcised. We have the law of Moses, and they are heathens. They are pagans. They do not know God, but we stand in judgment over them. This is the context of chapter 2. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Verse 3, But do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? O man is an idiom for the Jewish people, for their faith, their religion, their relationship with God. They are called O man. And so... He is speaking directly to the Jewish people. Do you think that you can look at the Gentile world and look at the nations, and then you practice the same thing and be in judgment over them? In fact, God will judge you as you pass judgment upon them. Now, Jesus warns the Jewish people of this as he's teaching them the right way to judge. He says, judge righteously. And when we judge, we judge in a way that righteously represents God, not just in what we're saying, but with our life. He says, first get the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to get the speck out of your brother's eye. What he is saying is first take care of your own life, then you can help your brother. But if you have all of this sin in your own life, how can you help your brother that's dealing with something that's probably even smaller than what you have within your own life? Judge not, lest you be judged. Don't judge with hypocrisy, but when you do judge, judge in a righteous way. As believers, this is just a side note, we are to judge, but we are to judge righteously, To do that, you do not judge with hypocrisy, and we do not judge to condemn. The law already condemns. It already makes sin very clear. But as believers, 
we come and we see something that is wrong, and when we see that it is wrong, we are able to speak the truth in love and try to help people to come out of the situations that they're in. This doesn't represent God. God can change your life. God can bring uh, your heart into a better place and change your life from the inside out. There is the element of looking at it and making a decision, is this right or is this wrong? Here, what we're talking about, going back to the specific context, is that if we're living in sin, if the Jewish people are living in sin, how can they look upon the nations and judge them? In fact, God will judge them. Let's read verse 3 again. But do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Question mark. That means, no, you will not escape God's judgment. The wrath of God is against you, just like it is against all of humanity that has walked away from God. Yes, Scott. I also just wanted to mention this term, practice such things, if you didn't listen to the last podcast or maybe haven't read through all of chapter one, the list is there, what such things is. But also, can you share a little bit about the difference between practicing sin and committing a sin? Yes, it's a great question because we're going to deal with this in the first eight chapters. Practicing sin is a lifestyle of sin. It's what you are serving And so everyone commits sin, and in 1 John, we will deal with a Gnosticism that says that we can live a perfect life and we don't commit sin. So all of us commit sin, but if you get to chapter 3 of 1 John, anyone who practices sin is not born of God. So if you're in the control of sin and it's master over your life, then you cannot be of God. The emphasis here in chapter 1 and in chapter 2 also is in the practice of sin. When we get to chapter 6, we'll see, And sin shall not be master over you, because you're not under law, you're under grace. It's actually the grace of God that breaks the bondage of sin, and we're going to see that as we move through this dialogue. So the emphasis is practicing. It's a lifestyle. It defines who you are. And if you go back to the list in verses 18 through 32 of chapter 1, you will see all of these things. And it's not an exhaustive list, but it's contrary to the character and the knowledge of God. It's contrary to the Word of God, and those people are practicing those things. Now, the Jewish person says, well, we have the law of God. But if you practice the same thing, don't think that you will escape the judgment of God. If your life is the same as this person, and you think because you have the law of Moses or that you're a Jewish person that you will escape the judgment of God, Paul is saying no. Yeah, and I like, Laura, that thinking about what you brought up, too, that's talking about practicing, which to me, what Paul's getting at, you know, in this whole letter is the issue of the heart, you know, where where is your heart at? And speaking to the the Jewish population about their heart, you know, you're saying these things are bad, but in your heart are all these things that you're practicing, you know, and their heart was wrong. They're thinking they're better than the other people just because they have the law, they have the covenant of God, all of those things, but their heart's not right. And back to sort of the committing and practicing, we go to a a congregation here that deals with a lot of drug, drug addicts, people, you know, with really deep issues with addiction. And, you know, sometimes you see those people People relapse and come go back, but most of them, their heart still wants to come clean. Their heart still wants to not make those mistakes. They're not sitting there saying, oh, I can just do this and get away with it. It's fine. You know, they know they've messed up. So maybe if someone's hearing that and you're struggling with an addiction or some type of sin in that nature, if your heart's there and you want to change, God, God can bring you through it. And I don't necessarily define that as practicing when you want to change and you're, you're trying to. Well, let's talk about that because we're skipping ahead a little bit to being circumcised of the Messiah. The problem is the heart, and we're going to get to that in this chapter. It's not enough just to want to get away from sin, but if sin is master over you, then can you say that I belong to God? That's what we deal with in 1 John, that yes, the heart has to be right, but the heart, if the heart is right, then the life will be a life that honors God. So if a person is back into addiction and they're living in sin, 
they're under the bondage of sin. Can they truly say, well, I don't really want to do this, and my heart is right, therefore I'm not responsible for my actions? What I would say is that if the heart is right, the action will be right. If the heart is longing for God, then their life will walk in a way that pleases God. And it doesn't mean that they don't struggle, but can they go back into bondage and addiction to drugs and still say, my heart is right with God, and I don't believe so? It's still an issue of the heart. It's still something that they have to come back to and say, what is wrong? What is missing? What is missing within inside of me that I'm still longing for something and willing to give my life to something outside of God? And so that's how I would look at it. But I agree fully with you, Alan, that the issue here is a heart issue. And as we go through chapter 2, we're going to see sometimes the Gentiles do better with the law than the Jewish people do. And what is a true Jew, one that has been circumcised of the Messiah? Not talking about the flesh, but talking about the heart. And we're going to get to that as we go through here. Let's look at verse 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Look at those three words there, because those are words that are being used all the time today. Of his kindness, God's kindness, God's tolerance, and God's patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. When we look at these words, the kindness of God is breaking the bondage of addiction, breaking the bondage of the things that are destroying our lives, and his patience and his tolerance and his kindness is leading us to repentance. And one of the biggest problems with the gospel today is that we're thinking that God, who is a God of love and tolerance and patience and kindness, that his wrath is not against us. God is a God of love. Go back to chapter 1. God's wrath is against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. What is his tolerance, his patience, and his kindness? The character of God is leading us to repentance. That's the whole message here. Repentance that leads us to faith in Christ that changes us from the inside out. So a person has got to say, I don't want to live this lifestyle anymore. I want to put my faith in Christ. I want to live for God. So look at verse 4 again. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness? Whose kindness? God's kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. That's where we see the kindness of God, is when we see a person truly repent of their sins before God. As a young mother, often my heart was that bleeding heart, you know, for the child of not wanting to punish them or confront their sin and their disobedience. But You have to really break down that softness of your heart if you really want to see the child come into a whole healthy life. And we have to really accept that part of God is such a blessing to us. Yes. And God loves us enough. God is kind to us. God is merciful. God is gracious to us that he's leading us to repentance, just like a parent does with a child. Now, let's look at verse 5, because it brings in what Alan was talking about. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, because your heart was not right, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. What Paul is saying, if we have an unrepentant heart, we are storing up wrath for God's judgment. The issue is the heart. The issue is making sure that our hearts are right with God. And if the heart is not right, the life will not be right. Those two will always go hand in hand. And in verse 6, he quotes from Psalm 62, who will render to each person according to his deeds, that the life speaks about what is going on from within side, And God's judgment God will give and render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. 
so that those who, with perseverance, they seek in doing good, they're seeking for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. Now let's look at this, and we're going to have to see it in its complete context here. There are some that are seeking to do good because they want to live a life that is pleasing unto God, and they understand that God would render to each person according to his deeds. But others that do not have the right heart, they follow unrighteousness, they obey unrighteousness, and what is waiting for them is wrath and indignation. However, when we get to chapter 3, we're going to see People seek to do what is good, but there is none that are righteous, not even one. Gentile, Jew, Jew, Greek, whatever the designation is of our background, whether we have the law of Moses externally or we have a law within our own hearts, a conscience, there is none that are righteous, there is not even one. So we look at this, there are people who seek to do good, And it comes from a heart that is repentive before God, and they're wanting eternal life. They're seeking for eternal life. They're seeking for immortality. They're seeking for glory and honor. But there are also those who have selfish ambition, and they obey unrighteousness. What they have in the future, wrath and indignation. Would you say there's a difference there at the beginning of verse 6 when he says he will render to each one according to his works? A difference between works unto salvation versus works unto reward for the believer? The context here is not speaking at this point to the believer in Christ. The context is speaking to the Jewish person or the Jewish nation that is passing judgment upon the rest of the world because of their actions, their practicing evil. And now Paul is turning his attention to the Jewish person who sits in judgment over them, but yet they practice the same thing. When we look at Psalm 62, God will render to each person according to their actions, their works, their deeds that a person that is seeking, that is seeking for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life, they want to do good and pleasing unto God, and there is a reward for that. And then when you see the opposite of that in verse 8, they do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness and wrath and indignation. So there are two different people, one going one direction, one the other. However, The overall context is that we're flowing through these chapters to chapter 3, and we're going to get to the point that both Jew and Greek are both under sin, and there's none that is righteous, there is not even one. People seek for eternal life, they seek for immortality by doing what is right. However, the reality is, Chapter 3, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. So we're flowing in a context here. If you isolate it that, you might think that a person could just by their deeds have eternal life, but they're seeking for this. And then as we go through, you'll see there is none that is righteous. There's not anyone that's going to stand before a holy and righteous God and be holy by their own works and their deeds to have eternal life. But there are people that are seeking for this. Verse 9, we read verses 7 and 8. Let's read verse 9. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also the Greek. So here, just like the gospel first to the Jew and also to the Greek, here it is also the tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil. There's a day of judgment. There's a day of wrath. There's a day of tribulation, a day of distress, and first to the Jew and also to the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whatever your background, what is important to God is not that you have the law of Moses, not that you call yourself a Jew or you're a Gentile. What is important is what? Your actions, your deeds, your works, and God will render 
to each person according to his deeds. And also remember, going back to what Alan was saying earlier, that if the heart's not right, the action will not be right. And we see this as we go back to verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself and the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So how are we going to have good deeds? The heart has to be right. Let's keep reading here, verse 11. For there is no partiality with God. And we're dealing with Jew versus Greek. For all have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So the person that practices sin has sinned without the law will perish without the law. They will come under the judgment of God without the law of Moses, and all who sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Now, what Paul is dealing with here, and if you isolate Scripture, you may think that you can keep the law and be justified before God. But we're flowing in a context. I'll keep saying that over and over. Because when you get to chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says, Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So no one's going to be able to keep the law to the point that they would be justified before God. But he's making a statement here in the context. It's your actions, your life that speaks and what is important to God. Let me read this verse again. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Now look at verses 14, 15, and 16. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, and that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Here he is saying that sometimes the Gentiles do better with the law than the Jewish person because they have a law written in their hearts. Now, this is a different context from Jeremiah chapter 31. This is a context that is talking about a conscience of knowing right and wrong. Also, I want to mention here, everything that we have discussed through this point when we're talking about the law, we're talking about the moral aspects of the law, the character of God, whether or not mankind represents God's character or character of rebellion against God. So therefore, the Gentiles many times do a better job in keeping the law, the moral aspects of the law, reflecting the character of God. They have a conscience. They have the law of God written on their hearts. They may not have the law of Moses. They may not go into the synagogue and read the Torah and be instructed out of the law of Moses, but sometimes their actions, their deeds are better than the Jewish person that has the law of Moses. Now let's read in verse 17. It's going to become very strong from Paul against the Jewish person that wants to rely upon the law. Verse 17, but if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of truth. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? You who say one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, through the breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. 
That last quote, that last statement is from Isaiah 52. It's also found in Ezekiel 36 that through their breaking of the law, through their dishonoring of God, the Gentiles, the nations that they were to be a light to and to instruct them in the things of God, now the nations blaspheme the name of God because of the Jewish people. So what God is putting an emphasis on in these passages, what Paul is saying, is your actions. It's not that you've been set apart in order to teach the world concerning what is right and wrong. What is your life? What are you practicing? What are you doing? So if you say one thing and do the opposite, what is happening, you're blaspheming the name of God among the Gentiles. God is interested in our actions, and if our heart is not right, then our actions will not be right. Whether or not we call on the name of God or we're worshiping in pagan temples, if our actions are the same, what's the difference? And so this is what is being said by Paul to the Jewish people. We know that the world has rebelled against God, but the Jewish person says we have the law and we're not like them. But what God is saying, sometimes they do it better than you. They have an internal law, and you have the law of Moses, but the nations blaspheme the name of God because of your hypocrisy. And that is bringing up the prophets and their message as they spoke to Judah as well. Now let's look at verse 25. For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. And I would ask everyone to look at Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. This really summarizes Jeremiah's whole ministry. It's the last two verses. I'm not sure if it's 25 and 26, but it's the last two verses that God considers all of Israel uncircumcised because their hearts are uncircumcised. Circumcision of the flesh is of value if you're keeping the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. And God considered all of Israel uncircumcised because their hearts were uncircumcised. There in Jeremiah chapter 9. So if the uncircumcised man, the Gentile, keeps the requirements of the law will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who through having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? Verse 28 is very important. Speaking to the Jewish person, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. This is bringing in the whole message of Jeremiah to the Jewish people, that Jeremiah chapter 9 is your heart has to be right, and God wants to change us from the inside out. And when we look at the person that is physically circumcised, but if they do not keep the law, doesn't God consider them uncircumcised? And the man that is uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who through having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? So the Gentiles that are uncircumcised, if their actions, their deeds, their works are better than yours, will they not sit in judgment over you? So it's not enough just to have the law of Moses. It's not enough just to put it in a contemporary setting, to go to a service every week. It's not enough to have a Bible in your house and to give some money into the offering and all these kind of things. God is looking at your life and how is your life changed? And the only way to have a changed life, that your life reflects the character of God, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, is to be changed from the inside out and to have a circumcised heart. This circumcised heart comes by the power of God's Spirit, and we are living a life that wants to please God, not pleasing men, but pleasing God. 
And so it's an inward work of God's Spirit that changes the heart, and it's a circumcised heart that changes our life, that we can live a life that we're not in bondage to sin. This is a foundational piece that Paul is building, and you cannot isolate chapter 2 from chapter 3. What Paul is doing in chapter 2 is basically saying, Jew, Gentile, you're all in it together in the sense that you're all living a life that is displeasing to God. And you're seeking, some seek to do what is good, and through your actions you want to be justified unto God. But as we come to chapter 3, nobody is going to be justified before God by the works of the law. Whether it's the internal law that the Gentiles have or the law of Moses that is set before them that they can read on a weekly basis, what is important to God is that we're changed from the inside. And we're going to get to chapter 3 that that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Chapter 8 is all about a life in the Spirit. Chapter 7, the law cannot change us from the inside out. Chapter 6, it's the grace of God that breaks the bondage of sin. It's all about being changed from the inside out so that we can live a life that is pleasing to God. And that comes through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, Scott, I, I remember what you said the other night when we were talking about this, but, you know, anyone can go and get circumcised, right? Just common sense, like you can go get circumcised, like that's easy to do. And the same thing, anyone can pull well, into a... If you want to say that, yes. Well, depending on the age. <laughs> but um, remember, but, on the law, it's on the eighth day, yes. Yeah, so as a baby, <laughs> it's pretty easy to, you don't remember it. Being And just the same, anyone can go into a, a Sunday service. If yes. Your congregation worships on, you can pull in and do that. But you can't have the fruit of the Spirit without the Holy Spirit working inside of you in a changed heart. And, you, and that's the way you get those actions. Without that, you go back to... Um, the end of chapter one, all those you know lists that Paul lays out about the flesh and the things you're doing wrong, that's in our nature. And so you can't change that without a supernatural work from the Spirit. It's just common sense seeing it when Paul lays it out this way, but you still see today even in you know, modern Judaism where such this emphasis on the oral law, did you wash your hands, you know, the rabbis, all these things, when it's really, what is your life? The, di- the dietary laws, the Sabbath laws, all of these things that are so important. Yeah, and you see that, and I mean, you know, we've talked about it. I lived in, in New York City for a while. It's a big Jewish population. You know, you see some of this, the really bad things, you know, happening in that, you know, sort of Hasidic and religious Jewish community um, that, you know, and they're trying to tell, you know, us as Gentiles that we're not doing right, we're not circumcised, but they're not living right. You know, their heart's not right, and people on the outside see it. And, and Paul's really kind of honing in on that, that it's only by a work of the Spirit, a supernatural work, that you can really do the things that you're, you're supposed to do and live in a right way. And it's not just crossing off whatever list it is you think you need to cross off. Yes, and I'm going to say one last thing about that. He says it's the circumcision of the heart, and circumcision is that which is of the heart. That has always been true, Old Covenant, New Covenant. Moses said, circumcise your hearts. It's always been about a relationship with God from the heart. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Jeremiah says all of Israel is uncircumcised because their hearts are uncircumcised. And he places them in the same category as all the nations, the Gentiles, that are not physically uncircumcised, but they're considered not circumcised because their hearts are not circumcised. So Paul's going to say in chapter 10, it's with the heart man believes, Romans chapter 10. It's always an issue of the heart. It represents who we are, what is flowing from the innermost being. And when we're changed on the inside by God's Spirit, that's how our lives can be lived for God that are pleasing to God and the bondage of sin that is broken. And this will come through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So man seeks to be holy. Man seeks to do right. Some are even seeking eternal life by doing what is right. But we're about to read the reality that no one in their own righteousness will stand before a holy and righteous God and be righteous. 
In fact, Isaiah the prophet says, our righteousness, talking about the Jewish people, our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. No one can stand in their own righteousness. We're seeking to do what is good, but there has to be a propitiation, and we're going to get to that in chapter 3, an atoning sacrifice that deflects the wrath of God where we come to be at peace with God and God's salvation. So I'm getting ahead, jumping to chapter 3, but it's so important that we see this within context. All of chapter 2 has to be seen within the context of chapters 3 through 8. And before we pray, I just wanted to, just a little personal note, here where it says in verse 24, as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And that is just something personally that I just want to keep in my heart to never call someone to say, look at her hypocrisy. Why would I want to serve God? And so as we claim to follow the Lord, we have to be a light everywhere we go, always checking our heart and never giving anyone a reason to turn from God. We want to give people a reason to turn to God because of our good deeds. Yes, and so every day let's check our hearts and say, God, create in me a clean heart, O God. And that heart has to be clean and pure before God if the actions that we want to have that reflect God's character are going to take place. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for this time together. Thank you, Lord, that your word is so true. And Heavenly Father, give to us clean hearts, pure hearts, washed by the water and your spirit within us, O God. And I pray, O Heavenly Father, that we will be changed from the inside out every single day, serving you and knowing you, a relationship with you from the heart. O God, this is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to learn more about IGM or have any questions about this podcast, feel free to reach out to us at info at integritygm.com and connect with us on Instagram at integrity underscore global and Facebook at integrity global missions. If you like our podcast, please share it and leave a review. Thank you for listening. Have a blessed day.